All right, so we're going to talk story. This is part of the Ask the Building Expert series. Uh, my name is Lance Luke. I'll be the host and the guy uh, talking about uh, different uh, subject matters today. Uh, we have a Zoom platform uh, that's live, and we're also uh, live streaming on Facebook this morning. And uh, welcome, everybody. Thank you for attending. Uh, let me go through these slides fast. And the reason for the series is uh, we want to help building owners, condo associations, property managers, homeowners, and anybody who uh, needs help in building and construction matters. So I want to introduce Martin Pea, who's actually the co-host and the back-end IT guy. Uh, he's actually responsible for um, making sure that we're we're live and we're we're active. So um, if somehow there's a glitch, then I usually send him a nasty text going, hey, wake up, let's get back on the show here. So uh, interesting enough that previous webinars, uh, I've talked about concrete, like concrete spalling, concrete repair, and things like that. So instead of concrete, what's another building product that uh, we have today? And, that's been used over the years, it's wood. So the topic is wood repair, uh, method to the madness. And uh, this webinar is also sponsored by Construction Management Inspection, which is a construction management company that I own. We run various uh, construction projects, mainly for uh, condominium buildings, but also office buildings, shopping centers, and, and so forth. So. Um, what, what I like to do is um, help people by giving them information that they can use. So I always like to say that building knowledge never stops when you're helping to protect people and property. So building knowledge and also knowledge about buildings and we're here to help. And why is the title Wood Repair Method to the Madness? Because it's not that simple there's some madness involved and there's a methodology that should be followed and we're going to go right into it. So the first thing that we do is, uh, if, if you have a, a house or a townhouse complex or any kind of wood frame building and uh, it hasn't been maintained uh, like it should have, uh, or even if it has, it's, you know, also, uh, things that need to be done, such as painting, caulking, uh, minor wood repair due to wood rot or termites. So the very first thing we do, and just for discussion's sake, when uh, building owners or condo associations or property managers, board members call me and say, I have a townhouse property, uh, I, I need to fix my uh, wood areas and paint, what should be done? Or can you come out and take a look? So basically the protocol is this, you take a survey of the wood repairs and it's called a conditional survey. And we do a conditional survey report and it's sort of like a building inspection report. Like we walk around and we, we take a look at things, but it's mainly geared towards looking at areas of wood that need to be repaired, such as your wood siding, trim. Uh, if you have um, a deck, uh, stairs, a balcony, we look at railings, hand railings, the stairs, uh, also your uh, roof uh, fascia areas, anything that's made out of wood, your window frames and all that. So we do a visual survey and it's building by building and it could be unit by unit uh, and, and note down the areas that need to be uh, repaired or replaced. Okay, So there's basically uh, two types of inspections. One is a physical visual inspection where we're looking at uh, rotted areas or areas that, that don't seem to be solid. The other type is called a destructive testing inspection where we would um, 
use an instrument and, and do probing. And the instrument could be a screwdriver, it could be an ice pick, um, you know, a long rod that's pointed. And we would uh, tap the areas of the wood and then poke the areas. And if uh, it's rotted or termite eaten, it'll be hollow. So when we poke it, there'll be a, a hole there. And it's pretty easy to uh, find out. Sometimes I use a screwdriver. I use the, the, the back, the handle part of a screwdriver and I start tapping the wood. And a lot of termite inspectors use that method. Maybe not the screwdriver, maybe they have a other, another instrument, <clears throat> but um, that's what they use. And it's easier to find and, and locate uh, rotted areas or termite damaged areas. And then we list it down in a report. In some cases, uh, I, either myself or the contractor would take a, a spray, uh, spray can, a spray paint and, and put X's or make uh, an arrow or whatever to the rotted areas. But it's unsightly, it doesn't look good. But when we're working on a building and we take one building like a townhouse building and we know we're gonna do wood repair, we go there and kind of graffiti things up so that uh, we know what areas need to be uh, taken off. So it doesn't look good at first, but uh, all those will disappear when there's new wood put on. Now we don't do that on, if the complex is 10 buildings, we don't do all 10 buildings and then you have like what looks like graffiti. Okay, so we only do it as, as we need to, that way the property still looks kind of presentable. So let's say we do our condition survey report, we have a list, now what do we do, okay? We create outline specifications. So outline specs are needed and there's actually, uh, when you're building a new uh, townhouse or a new house, there should be uh, outline specifications or specifications that, that basically tell you, uh, you know, how to build it and, and you know, what, what to build, what kind of materials to use. So let's say we're building a new townhouse. We look at the plans, we look at the specs and you're creating it from scratch. You're, you're building this building from scratch, okay? Which is a lot easier than repairing an existing building when there's wood rot in certain areas because now you're dealing with a building that's already built. It's harder to repair a building that's existing and it's easier to build one from scratch brand new because nothing's in the way. You're, you're free, the carpenter's free to uh, have the space that he needs and all that to do the work. So as you can see, uh, there's framing involved and then uh, there's siding that goes over the frame, there's trim and all that. So in a wood repair project, it's the opposite. It's called deconstruction, okay? So what it is in simplest form is you're removing bad wood and replacing the bad wood with good wood. But you got to keep in mind that you have to select siding that matches. Um, you need to make sure there's a moisture barrier installed, like a Tyvek system, what kind of nails you're gonna use, uh, what kind of caulking and what kind of paint. So that's just basic. There's a lot more details that go into it, but just so that you know, it's not just removing a piece of wood and replacing it because you got to specify like how much wood is it going to is going to be replaced. If if there's a uh, a two by four trim and it's only rotted uh, two feet, do you need to replace the whole two by four, you know, or do you just replace the little rotted section? Same with the siding. If there's a a two foot by two foot siding that's rotted. Uh, do we just replace that rotted section or do we replace the whole four by eight sheet? Okay, and there's reasons why you would need to replace the whole uh, sheet and uh, I'll explain later. And later is probably right now. So repairing the right way. So I got uh, some uh, photos that I took of a recent project uh, going on. And as you can see, there's uh, new wood trim. There's horizontal uh, trim, 
call it a belly band and there's a vertical trim, uh, which is, um, you know, at, at the edges. So if you look at the uh, unpainted lumber, those are the new repair. And as you can see, uh, if it's a two-story building or, or a three-story building, it's not that easy. You need a ladder, you need a, a scaffolding system um, or uh, some method for the contractor to reach the you know, higher floors. So there's always that situation to deal with. So how do you repair the right way? You make sure that uh, the sections, so instead of replacing a little, you know, one foot section, and you don't want like a jigsaw puzzle look, uh, the contract is directed to replace the entire uh, board, the entire piece, because the more cuts you have, the more chances of rotting in the future, water getting in. And, and it doesn't look good because even if when you have it painted, you can still see the joint lines and everything because it caulk it. And it's like, oh, what is this? Uh, a, you know, jigsaw puzzle. So we don't want too many cuts, too many small pieces. Yes, it costs more because you're using uh, more lumber, but that's how to repair the right way. Siding is the other thing. If you have a small section, and, and let's say a lot of the time the siding gets rotted at the ground level and the rest is okay. So contractors usually cut maybe uh, two feet, three feet higher off the ground and replace that. The building doesn't look that nice, but it saves money. I don't specify that method. I specify entire four by eight sheets. And that way you don't have a problem with the building not looking that nice. Now, if it's a money issue and we got to do it that way, then okay, that's the only way to do it. But basically uh, the right way is to use bigger sheets of siding, uh, bigger sections of lumber for your trim and belly band and things like that, rather than small cut up pieces, okay? Now, what kind of problems would occur in, in wood, you might ask? Oh, you probably already know. Be aware there's termite damage and wood rot. Now, hopefully you guys can see the uh, images, but uh, on the left side, it's a deck and they had siding and, and the siding was rotted and we took the siding off and lo and behold, uh, that N four by four post was uh, rotted and uh, could have been termite eaten. I'm not sure. Sometimes it's both termites and wood rot. And then if you look at the bigger image, uh, we took that siding off and it's like, wow, what happened here? So um, usually it's not visible. Okay, so the siding covers up the wall. And once the siding is removed to replace it, now guess what? You see what we don't wanna see is the wood studs and the structural framing members all rotted, termite eaten and damaged. And guess what? If it's really bad, now we have to replace the wall. So it's not only the siding that we needed to replace, but it's the entire wall or section of the wall. And this is structural framing. Now. This is an unknown condition. And that's why uh, there's change orders and cost increases because this is unknown. And it's hard for a contractor to bid on a fixed bid if there's unknown hidden things behind the wall, okay? Some other photos, um, as you can see the top photo, we didn't know about this, it's uh, termite eaten and it's covered up by paint. So the wood looks good until you get there and start tapping on it and then it's, it's hollow. And um, the bottom photo is just uh, more termite damage. So most of these problems are wood rot and termite damage. And it's because the building hasn't been tented or inspected often enough. And um, the, usually I would say uh, inspect at least once a year and have a full inspection. That way you would catch these things and it's easier and cheaper to fix something where uh, the rot just began 
and it costs $500 or $1,000 to fix, whether um, as opposed to you leave it like that and 10 years later, now you're talking about a $25,000 repair that would have been way cheaper had you attended to it in the first place when uh, the damage first started. So there's also um, in a townhouse building, this is the one in Eva, uh, if you have ferns or plants growing on your siding, uh, that's not uh, a very good sign. That's a red flag, like what's going on? Hasn't anybody inspected these things? You know, and you look at the fern and it's like, this thing has been like a year old now. So this is negligence. If you look at the bigger photo uh, and you see that corner section below that, that elbow of the gutter, that's a repaired area that was repaired before and now it's rotted again. So this is a reason why I don't specify jigsaw puzzle repair because it looks bad and the same problem could occur again. And also if you look at the siding, it's rotted and uh, it's overdue. The siding is rotted, the trim's rotted. What happened was the gutter was leaking and this was years and years and because of one leak in gutter, now it, it, it caused $6,000 in wood repair. So that's not uh, you know, a good thing. It could have been repaired for cheaper. But I have a, a, a little uh, story to tell you. I got called uh, by this uh, manager uh, at a townhouse and he said, oh, we got termite damage. I need your help to, to look at it. And so I drove over uh, checked it out. It was this uh, storage building connected to the townhouse. And I go, wow, this thing is infested with ground termites. And he goes, yeah, look how bad it is. And I said, well, don't worry. The termites are, are dead. They got killed because uh, of the toxic mold. And he says, what? And I said, no, I'm only kidding. But, um, you know, be beware. Also, if you don't attend to the wood damage on siding, then it could uh, cause mold and toxic mold, which is uh, not good. So you don't want these kind of uh, surprises. And uh, just, to, just to let you know that the siding material for wood frame structures that were built in the 60s and the 70s, okay, mainly in the 70s, the commonly used product was masonite siding. And that siding was deemed to, to be defective. And, and it's commonly known as hardboard siding. And I always joke and I call it cardboard siding because what happens when it gets wet, it expands and it gets rotted and it's not solid wood, it's manufactured wood. So just be aware, if you're living in a property or you manage property that has this kind of siding, eventually it'll get rotted. Uh, no matter how many times you paint, it'll still be a problem. And that's why um, condo associations and building owners don't paint when they need to. And once the paint fails and water gets into the wood, their siding is gone already. It's like far, far too damaged. So structural failure surprises. Sometimes you got uh, damage uh, from termites that, that go all the way to the roof. And now you have your roof sagging. It's like, why is that roof like sagging? And then we go in the attic and we see, oh, now we know why. The roof framing is completely eaten up. And then you have uh, uh, a beam that got eaten up too. So, you know, do these things need to be repaired? Uh, yeah, definitely. It's a, a problem. Okay. Now, um, I think I got a couple more pictures. Yeah, here's a, another one at the top. This uh, truss uh, cord is completely gone. So is the roof supported? No, it's not. The termite just ate right through it. And then the bottom photo is a floor, a house that had uh, original wood flooring that they added planks on. And when you walk on the floor, you know, it gives way and go, oh, what's going on with this? And uh, when uh, sections of the, the top uh, wood plank was cut out, the original flooring was gone. It was just uh, paper thin, okay? So um, 
remember that um, things could get in the way of wood repair. Let me uh, let me go to this thing. Okay, so if you look at the photo, okay, and I I'm, I'm not sure where this. I think this is in Hawaii Kai, but but anyway, um, let's say for example that we have to replace some some of the siding. There could be things in the way of the siding. There could be a window trim. There could be electrical boxes. There could be a light fixture. Uh, there could be a gutter in the way. It could be some roofing in the way. So in a general scope of a wood repair project and you're replacing siding and trim, there could be things in the way. So that have to be removed. Like in order to replace a siding where you got a light fixture, you got to re remove the light fixture to get to the junction box. Okay, So it's not as easy as people think. And that's why it takes more time uh, for the work to be done because they may have to disconnect the gutter in order to replace the rotted siding behind the gutter and then you know put the gutter back. I've had projects where uh, we had to replace the uh, eve fascia that's a trim on a roof and we have to call a roofer to take off the shingles first while the woods replace and then put the shingles back or we just have a roofer uh, do the work because we want to maintain the uh, original uh, roofing warranty so uh, there could be surprises that come up and then so i took you through pretty much the the uh, the whole motion of a wood repair project, identify uh, areas that need to be repaired, uh, make sure the specs are written, a contract is hired, they go in there and replace sections of the wood uh, caused by either wood rot or termites. And then at the end, when they're all done, of course, they're going to caulk and paint. Okay? Um, if they're not, if they're only the carpenter and you have a, a painter that's going to come behind the carpenter or after, the woodwork is finished. Okay, you got to make sure that is a carpenter going to do the caulking or is a painter going to do the caulking. Okay, now I've had situations where I got called in after the fact and it wasn't in the carpenter's contract to caulk and it wasn't in the painter's contract to the caulk. Okay, it was uh, the painter's contract only called for painting, but that's normally. Uh, Caulking is normally a painter's job, but the painters say, no, if the guy carpenter did the wood repairs, he should be caulking his, his new wood joints, not the painter. So I had to resolve that issue. But in any case, um, the project's finished. You do a final punch list and then you accept the work and make sure there's a warranty. If there's no warranty for the work, then that's not good. You want to make sure there's some kind of warranty for uh, labor and materials. And what we normally say is a one-year warranty. If the contracts are willing to give a two-year warranty, then that's fine. Now, on a painting uh, situation, uh, usually it's only a one-year or could be two years, but that's not the material warranty. Okay? That's only the labor warranty. The paint manufacturer will give a five-year warranty or a 10-year warranty. So when you hire the contractor, you need to make sure what kind of warranty am I getting. And if he says, I'm, a, I'm only giving a one-year warranty, going, well, that's not, that's not the case here because you're buying paint that comes with a five-year warranty or 10-year warranty. You got to give the same warranty as what the paint manufacturer is giving. You can't make it less, okay? So make sure those fine details are specified in the contract. Okay? So basically um, that's the entire wood repair project, the method to the madness. I know it's very simple. I could give a four hour uh, lecture on wood repair and all that, but that's not what this webinar uh, is about. It's just to get you acclimated and give you the uh, key points uh, takeaway points and helping you on your wood repair project. And it doesn't matter if it's your own single family house or duplex, you're 
uh, working on or a huge townhouse complex. And I've, I've had projects that I've worked on, wood repair, uh, that was one to $4 million of wood repair and, and painting. So it's not, uh, you know, a, a cheap fix and you got to do things the right way. So that's probably um, takes us to the end of the formal presentation. And then let me, uh, before I open up to uh, q and I want to tell you what you miss. Uh, we've been giving these webinars since the uh, beginning of this year, and we've done a whole bunch. And uh, topics that you may have missed would be concrete spalling, roofing, hurricane ties, painting, uh, plumbing. I don't know if I gave an electrical one. Uh, cast iron piping, uh, uh, reserve studies for condos, uh, construction defects, uh, contractor licensing, building codes and permits. There's a whole bunch. Um, but you missed the actual live presentation, okay? but um, we have it on Zoom on our website, uh, Zoom recording. So although you missed us live, um, you know, we, we have what you need and we have it when you need it because you go to our website, askbuildingexpert.now.site and you could watch whatever webinars we gave on demand, you know, at your own leisure. And if any time you watch the uh, webinars and you have any questions, feel free to reach out to us and we'll be able to help you. Also, uh, what's upcoming, uh, we have in a couple of weeks, we have a nice, interesting webinar on sound transmission issues. And lately, uh, they've been, we've been seeing problems with condominium owners complaining about sound from the unit upstairs. And it's been a prevalent situation because people are remodeling their units and they're putting in uh, tile, hardwood flooring, uh, laminate flooring, luxury vinyl uh, tile, and it's causing a, a noise issue. Okay, so we got that. Um, and then we have a uh, holiday party coming up and we're gonna have games and prizes and all that. Uh, so that's gonna be interesting. Sign up uh, on our website. And then um, we have 22 different topics for next year already. And we're going to put that on our website also that you can look at and pick and choose which one uh, you want to attend. And we're always about giving free knowledge and free information because that only helps the whole industry and uh, everybody else. So uh, I'm going to give you our website again. Phone number is 808-422-2132. Uh, uh, if you have any questions or comments, uh, once again, our website is askbuildingexpert.now.site. And I'd like to um, take this time now to uh, wake Martin up if he's sleeping or uh, eating a donut or whatever and see if uh, he can check out our uh, Zoom uh, chat feature. If you're on Zoom, you can use either a chat feature or a Q&A a feature that's on the platform, or there's a raise hand icon. You can click it on, it will open up your microphone. If you're on Facebook, you can post your comments on, on Facebook uh, or questions, and uh, hopefully we'll be able to uh, you know, get get back to you. So I uh, think, you know, I allotted uh, a, a lot of extra time to kind of answer people's questions because we get comments from people that uh, they enjoyed the presentation, but they learned more from the Q&A part because they may have the same question as somebody else or they're able to ask their own question. So uh, I'm leaving it uh, open now and uh, call uh, Martin up and see what kind of uh, questions we have from our audience. Once again, 
appreciate uh, you attending. And I know that we have not only people from uh, Honolulu, but uh, different islands and even uh, different areas from uh, the mainland. So it's, it's good. I know this webinar is uh, streaming uh, not only locally, but nationally and internationally. And uh, it's good. I don't mind if you're from the mainland or from a foreign country, uh, that's fine. Ask your questions and I'll be able to help. Now, the other thing is that if you have any ideas for future topics for webinars, um, we're, we're all open. Uh, this is an open forum. We welcome uh, suggestions and uh, if uh, we can fit it in, we'll, we'll do it. And uh, if you're still interested in the Florida uh, building collapse. I have a separate website where I have media interviews and um, I did a webinar too on what I think caused the problem and all that. So if you're interested, uh, it's Florida, Florida building collapse dot now dot site. But if you forget, just uh, send us an email and we'll be able to uh, get back to you. So Martin, um, turning it over to you. Okay, Lance, I'm here. You can hear me all right? Yes, very okay. good. Yeah, we have, a, we have a few questions that's uh, come in. So let me ask the first one here. It says, uh, I live in a townhouse property in Eva Beach, and we are planning to have our buildings fixed up. Do we need a building permit? Also, should we hire one contractor to do both wood repairs and painting, or should we hire two different contractors? What? Isn't, isn't that a two-part question? Are they trying to con confuse us? I think it's a three-parter, but go for <laughs> it. Okay, so um, I think I got the Eva Beach part, but I kind of missed the rest. But anyway, um, in, in answer to the question, um, there's two approaches, and this is how I run my projects or how I actually prepare. When I go out to bid, okay, there's two things that I, two ways to get get bids. You know what? I forgot to turn my uh, light on. Can you still see me? How's yeah, that? I can see you. Man, I wait to the end before I turn my light on. Jeez, I better read my notes next time on how to prepare for these webinars. Anyway, in answer to the question, um, how, how I do it is I, I gather the contractors. Okay, let's say I have the plan specifications or the scope of work. I gather the contractors and I invite uh, building contractors who do carpentry repair. And I invite uh, painting contractors and sometimes the building general contractors do both carpentry repair and painting. So I end up having bids from uh, general contractors for carpentry alone. I end up having uh, uh, proposals from painters alone, separate. And then I end up getting bids from contractors who are general contractors or painting contractors that will do both wood repair and painting. And then I combine it and I, and I look uh, to see who's cheaper. And sometimes uh, hiring one contractor would be uh, the least expensive that can do both wood repair and painting. And other times it would be cheaper to hire a separate uh, wood repair contractor and then a separate painting contractor. The reason why it should be cheaper if you use one contractor is because when they mobilize and they bring all the equipment, their ladders or scaffolding and um, whatever equipment they need, once they set it up and they do wood repair, they can actually leave that equipment there for the painting crews to use. Now, if you, if you hire a separate general contractor for wood repair and a separate painting contractor, each contractor has to mobilize and bring their own equipment. And that's why the the cost when you're using separate contractors is should be higher. Sometimes it's not depending. So um, hopefully 
that uh, answers that question. Now, the, the building permit question, okay, if you're talking about a small job that's only um, $1,500 for wood repair, no, you don't need a permit. But once the value of the construction, not including painting, just for wood repair, exceeds $1,500, then that triggers a need for a building permit. Okay, so on big projects that I work on that are uh, multiple townhouse buildings, yes, you need a building permit because of the scope of the work. Now, um, there's no building permit needed for painting, okay? But if you add the cost of wood repair and it's, it's big, then when you apply for the permit, um, your permit is based on the wood repair cost, not the painting cost. But there's times where uh, a painting contractor that only has a painting contractor's license, he doesn't have a wood repair license, ends up doing a project and the state contractor's license board allows that because it's considered uh, incidental and supplemental work. In other words, they need to fix the wood in order to paint, so you don't need a separate license. I don't do not agree with that, especially if um, well, you could get in trouble if you do it, and if you have hundreds of thousands of dollars of wood repair, and you can't say, well, the painter, you know, is, is painting and he needs to paint, so therefore he needs to replace the wood, but he doesn't have a, you know, wood repair or general contractor's license. So it can get a little tricky. If in question, uh, let us know and we can point you in the right direction. Okay, so um, I only answered two parts. What, was there a third part to that question? Uh, no, I think the third part, you, had, you answered it with the building permit, whether you get one contract or two and all the painting things. So you, you, you tackled them. Good job. Oh, okay, good. Um, anytime. Those of you who asked the question, if you have other questions or I didn't properly answer the question, just uh, you know, send a, a chat or a Q and A thing back to us, and then we'll I'll be happy to clarify it for you. Okay, good. Next question is, I'm a general contractor, and the question that I have is, how do I bid on the job when I do not know the extent of the wood rot and termite damage? Okay, um, so we got a general contractor uh, attending. Uh, Martin, uh, did I talk bad about contractors? I don't remember, but uh, in any case, here's how to do it. You, so you go to the uh, property, you do your um, physical inspection, you note down all the areas of rot, termite, damage, and whatever else that you see. Then you calculate what the cost of that's gonna be. I, I don't know what method you're gonna use. Some contractors use um, time and material, some contractors use how many man hours, uh, how much uh, do it take off on how much lumber you need, uh, how many sheets of siding trim and all that. So whatever your method is to calculate, and let's say you come up with 250,000, okay. And that makes sense. So that's your base bid. So when you're bidding, and by the way, I'm answering the contractors question, but this applies to everyone else too. If you're hiring a contractor, that's your base bid. So how are you gonna account for when you pull off siding and now there's termite damage or rot in the wood framing? You got uh, four pieces of uh, eight foot two by fours that you need to replace. You got two pieces of uh, four by fours and assorted trim and whatnot. So. How do you account for, for that? Here's how to do it. In your, in your contract or in your proposal, you have a base bid of 250,000, then you have unit costs okay, for unseen, unknown uh, conditions. And in your proposal, you list down each 
think if I have to replace the two by four, it's going to be X amount of dollars, uh, you know, labor and material or however you want to do it, or you do it unit costs or whatever, but make sure you have your listing. So you have an itemized listing. So when you get hired, okay, you know that you're going to get the base bid pay, okay, as contracted, but for unknown areas, you know you're going to get paid for that by unit cost because when your proposal accepted, you make your contract accordingly, then there's no way that you're going to be doing free work, okay, because that's an allowance, a unit cost allowance, typical of spoiling repair. There's unknown conditions and the contractor charges unit costs. Unit costs could, could be per square foot, per linear foot, per board foot, whatever, but make sure you specify it that way, that way that you don't get nailed later and say, well, I thought everything was included. Um, and, you know, unit uh, owners, uh, board members, property managers, they don't like change orders. But this type of project of wood repair, a change order is expected. Now, let's say that there was no termites and no wood rot, and you're just doing everything on your base bid. Fine, that's good. But in a case where you may encounter a situation, especially you probably know that if the building is built in the 70s and no one ever repaired anything 20 for 20 years, guaranteed there's wood rot, termite damage in some areas. I mean, when I help write uh, roofing contracts, I specify. Uh, unit costs for unknown damages. And that way, everybody's protected. The contractor's protected, the owner's protected. The owner knows up front that if there's um, unforeseen costs that need to be done, it's already part of the contract already, right? That way there's no surprises. It doesn't matter who hires me, the contractor hires me or the association hires me, I want a win-win situation. I want to protect everybody. We're not here to try to rip off the contractor. We don't want to get ripped off ourselves, right? So anyway, um, hope that answered the question. And uh, we have any other questions? Yes, Lance, that was a, that was a good answer. Um, next question we have is, uh, we are having a painting project in Mililani starting next year. The painting contractor is doing the work, but his contract does not include any wood repair. Does that sound right? It sounds like there's gonna be a big problem either during the uh, project or, or after. Uh, and here's why I'm saying it's a problem. There's bound to be wood repair, if not good. There's about to be some wood repair needed. How is the how is a company painting company going to handle that? Okay, if it's not specified, they may say, "Oh, for us to go do that, it's going to be twenty five hundred dollars." Well, how do we know if that's the correct amount or, uh, or not, right? Um, or uh, you see, is the painter actually going to replace the wood? I've seen situations where. Uh, they just painted over wood rot. And when I asked why, they said, uh, oh, that wasn't included in our contract. Uh, okay, so, and I get called after the fact when there's already a problem and they want me to try to mediate things. And then I asked the contractor, well, didn't you think to even bring it up? Oh, no, uh, we told them. They said they didn't want to pay extra for replacing the wood. It doesn't look that bad. Just paint over it. Oh, okay. But where does it say that in, in your contract? Does it actually say that? Oh, no, it was a verbal agreement. So that's already a problem. Okay. He, he said, she said, whatever. There's no meetings of the minds. There's an argument at the end. And, of course, both sides have, have their, their purpose, right? One uh, wants to get the wood fixed and then, the painter doesn't want to do it unless he gets paid extra, which is understandably so. Um, so in this in this case, I think it's a problem. I think uh, uh, you should go back to the 
painting company and say, uh, I need you to give us uh, allowance sheet by unit cost. So if there's any areas that need to be repa repaired, we know what the cost is and we know that you're gonna do it. If you can't do it or don't know how, uh, you let us know and either we'll have somebody do it before you come and paint or you hire a subcontractor and do it. We don't want this issue where when the project's finished now, we still got wood rot and termite damage that you just paint it over, okay? Now, any owner, and it includes a, a condo association that allows a painter to paint over wood damage you're just wasting your money because you're wasting good paint over uh, you know, wood damage that needs to be torn out anyway. So the proper way to do things, best practices dictate that you have the wood, all wood repair areas fixed first before the paint goes on. And it doesn't matter who does the work, whether you hire a carpenter to do it or the painter does. It's probably better for the painter uh, and then you're working with one uh, contractor. But if the painting company doesn't do wood repair, then you should have thought about this earlier and asked the painting company, who do you recommend? Who do you use? Or you hire your own uh, carpenter to do all the repairs. Okay, But make sure after the repairs are done that you call the painter back and say, look at all these repairs and I want you to approve it before you paint it. I don't want you to tell us later, oh, that wasn't done properly and uh, that's why we couldn't paint it or that's why we just painted over it, although it needed to be fixed better. Okay, So there's different things like that that could help make the project uh, better. So got any other questions? Well, that, that's great tips, Lance, great tips. Um, the, the last one I have here right now is um, you talked about needing specifications, but who actually writes them? Does the board, the property manager, or the contractor? Okay. Um, so in, in a situation where, uh, remember I mentioned uh, you need to get a building permit for the wood repair. So in order to get a building permit, you need to hire a uh, architect or an engineer. And um, that design professional would draw plans and would write the specifications. Okay. So if they're only going, going to do the plans and uh, so any anybody can write the specifications. Usually it's not the property manager. Usually it's not the condo board. Although if there's architects or engineers on the condo board, they may you know, contribute and they may write. Um, the contractor could write the specs, but if they do, make sure somebody reviews it. Now, if you hire a building consultant or a construction manager, that person could write the specifications also. And um, if the contractor writes the specs, sometimes they're only writing it to, that may kind of benefit their side and not the owner's side. So that's why you need a third party consultant to help you. But you need specifications. You cannot just hire the contractor and let them do whatever he wants because when there's a problem, okay, and you would refer to the specs. In the absence of specifications, they're gonna the contract can say, well, there's no specs to follow. I just did it the way I normally did it for 20 years, right? Oh, okay, well. Uh, the 20 years that you've been doing it is not the right way. That's not uh, in accordance with industry standards. So therefore, I'm not approving it. And then you get into this tussle because um, there's no written guideline. It's easy for me to take out the uh, specs and say, look, this is what it says. This is, you're not following it. So therefore, it's wrong. I'm not approving it. I want you to fix it. Okay, it's so easy to do that. It's so easy to get the building plans to go, look, according to these plans, you didn't follow this. So you need to have backup documentation. So a lot of times I am called in when there's problems and I ask for a copy of the contract and I look at it and I go, um, you guys hired these contractors and you're spending $1.2 million and your contract is just a two 
page proposal. You know, this is nonsense. And it's because these people didn't hire an expert they didn't hire a third party consultant to help them review things. And that's how they got led down this dark path. And then it becomes a problem at the end to resolve because both parties think they're right. And in some cases, both parties are correct. It's just that there's an absence of entire scope of work specifications and all that. And this is what causes uh, problems, right? Conflict or even litigation at the end when there's no meaning of the minds. And that's why the meaning of the minds early on is the documentation is your, your scope of work, your specifications, your construction contract, your building plans, your painting specs. It's all lumped in uh, and commonly known as contract documents. And that's what we use. So why not follow the best practice and do the same thing? It's not going to costs you a lot more money. In fact, in some uh, jobs that, that I work on, uh, the condo association even has their legal counsel. They have their attorney review the construction contract and add in all their additional insurance clauses. We need final acceptance clauses and, and this and that. So uh, it could get really, really technical. It doesn't have to be that technical, but you want to make sure that everybody's on the same page before any work is starting. And that's the right way to do things. And when you do things right, chances are that at the end, it's going to come out good. It's, it's rare that there's things that couldn't be resolved. Now, if things go bad somehow at the end, referencing these documents documents help because then that was a guideline to begin with if there's an argument going yeah but it was agreed to read the contract it says from the beginning the contract uh, contractor was not going to supply this or supply that or the owner had to do this but they didn't do it so uh, you know there's complex construction litigation cases but we don't want to we don't want to go there that's why uh, preventive medicine is better than having to deal with the problem later. So preventive medicine in this case is getting all your ducks in a row, getting all your documentation. So the expectation is there from the beginning, not like, oh, I thought the, I thought the contractor, I thought you're going to repair our, our wooden fencing. And the contractor says, well, that wasn't in the contract. Look, look, how many fencing you have. And so the expectation is not there and then it becomes a problem. And then we pull out the contract and go, yeah, it's not included here. Oh, but we discussed it, right? Didn't we have a meeting and you said that you could do the fences and the contractor says, yeah, I said I can do the fences, but I didn't give you a quote on it because you said you hardly had enough money to fix the building. So if it's not in writing, there was no agreement. And that's why in, in, uh, construction contracts, you have a clause that says anything verbal doesn't count, right? It doesn't say that exact words. Basically, it says any verbal agreements that are not in writing is not enforceable. Uh, everything that is in writing or everything that is going to be agreed to after signing of this contract must be in writing. Otherwise, it's not enforceable uh, among the parties or something like that. That way, it's clear. You cannot just say, oh, I want you to uh, change this or change that, Mr. Contractor, and then the contractor does it, and he bills, and you go, oh, wait a minute, I thought you are going to do it for free. Well, that's not what it said in the contract, see? So uh, it's a give-and-take situation. When I work on projects, I like win-win all the time, you know, although most of the time I represent the owner, which is a condo association or an office building entity or shopping center owner, uh, or could be a homeowner that hires me to observe the construction repairs or addition or renovation of their house. And I always, I always try to be fair and not nickel and dime the contractor, but in some cases it doesn't end up that way. But that's why I always say, Give it, get everything in writing, follow up with emails, don't rely on verbal because that can get you in trouble, especially uh, high-end 
you know, I'm working on a house where it's a $2.5 million construction cost. And there's a lot of verbals in between. That doesn't count. I said, I want to see your emails. When, when did you tell the contractor to move the window? And what did the contractor say about it? Did the contractor agree in writing that he was going to do it for free? Or, or is he going to charge? And, oh, I thought he was going to do it for free. And the contractor says, why should I do it for free? I have to redo the wall now. And I can't eat that. You know, it's not a free lunch all the time. So anyway, these stories are based on my experience, and I'm sure I could tell you an hour more of stories, but uh, I know our time's limited. And uh, Martin, do we have any other questions, comments, either on the Zoom platform or on uh, Facebook? Uh, no, no more. You did uh, such a good job with all these uh, useful tips. Very, very helpful for okay. even for me. All right, that's good. Uh, so once again, uh, our seminar is ending, our webinar is ending, and I uh, wanna send our appreciation to you guys for attending. We always welcome people that wanna learn and uh, acquire knowledge about uh, what our topic is. We invite you to attend the next uh, webinar. The next webinar is especially interesting because not too many people I know have, have given this webinar on sound transmission issues. It's a very complicated subject that I'm gonna put into a, a lot easier term, sometimes maybe too easy, but that's how uh, the general public would understand it. So anyway, uh, we'll look forward to you guys attending the next webinar and uh, Sign up for our holiday party. There's going to be games, prizes, uh, music, and uh, things like that. So uh, until then, we'll see you guys at the uh, next webinar. Keep safe. Thank you very much. Aloha.